Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Berkshire Ornithological Club. I'm pleased to announce that uh, we've got some new members to welcome. So, Rebecca Rees, Edwin Bruce Gardner, John Davis, and Suki Sagu. So, if you're watching tonight, then welcome. Um, if you're in the audience here, welcome to make yourself known sometime. At that, the AGM, you may remember that um, we, we said that our treasurer, Eleanor Pitts, um, who's been the treasurer for quite some time, um, is wishing to stand down and she should be allowed to. So we are um, looking for a new treasurer. Um, so it's just a reminder about that. Um, we thought it would be a good idea if Eleanor um, says a few words now about what's actually involved with the role. So um, I'll hand over to Eleanor. She can unmute herself, please. And I haven't been on the list of participants yet. Well, okay. I have uh, to, uh... I'm not sure if you've downloaded the key. I can't see that in the Okay. Okay, well, well, we'll have to put that off for another time. <clears throat> okay, then the next meetings, meetings coming up indoors, we've got Professor Nick Davis, he's talking about the behaviour of cuckoos in a fortnight's time, and outdoors we've got a, a meeting at Small Green Lakes, which I'm leading, so it's a last chance to um, express your interest in that if you'd like to come, but in a fortnight's time, on Thursday the 20th, uh, Grey Burfoot is leading a, um, a trip to Blashford Lakes, which is um, always a good place to visit in the winter. Uh, get a good selection of gulls, unusual um, grebes sometimes, wildfowl. Okay, so let's move on to recent sightings. What, are, what have people been seeing? Can't see if anyone's hands put it. Wow. Well, birds I'm aware of are um, a few yellow leg gulls around. There's some at uh, Lower Farm and also at Lee Farm. Uh, there was quite a, an amazing report of 50 Brent geese, which almost touched down at Lee Farm right at the beginning of the year. Um, it's been Jack Snipe at Lower Farm, um, Great White Egret. Mediterranean gull at Lee Farm. Be a couple of sightings of lesser spotted woodpecker in the Wokingham area. Um, great white egrets, um, plenty of red wings. Anything else? Okay. Well, in that case, it uh, brings us to the main business of the evening. And that's to welcome Professor Will Cresswell. He's going to be uh, talking to us about African migrants. I'm sure you're all aware of the declines um, of some of these species. And he's been using uh, tracking to understand their movements and to try and understand the reasons why they are declining and perhaps look for some um, solutions um, things that can be done to help them in the future. Uh, Will is talking to us um, from Scotland uh, over Zoom, so I'll hand over to him and he'll share his screen. Hello everybody, um, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming tonight or, or tuning in tonight and thank you very much for in, uh, inviting me. Uh, as Robert mentioned, I'm, I'm up in Scotland. Um, I stay in a small town called Crail, which is by St Andrews. And um, if it wasn't dark and I could hold my screen up to the window, I could show you the North Sea and Bass Rock and the Isle of, Isle of May. I live in a very uh, lucky uh, situation. And if you're wondering why there's foliage, there's still 
little bit of Christmas left over there. So I'll share my screen with you and tell you what I'm going to talk about. Um, Sally, if you could be my wingman and if I start going wrong, if you can just wave at me and uh, <laughs> generally, I take it you can see my screen, Sally. Thumbs up. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to be talking about birds which are very familiar to you. Um, one third of European birds, British birds, uh, are actually African birds. They're very familiar to you in the summer, but unless you've been to Africa, they're actually quite strange and unknown. And there's been relatively little research work done on our very common birds that spend most of their time in Africa. And I've been going down um, to Africa since uh, 93, uh, 94. And still, at, at the time I was amazed how little work had been done and still uh, it's very much the case. And I know some of you um, watching, listening, will have been to Africa yourself, and you'll know it's an absolutely wonderful place. Can't understand why we don't follow the swallows every year uh, down to Africa. So I'm going to talk about the first half of the talk for the break, about just the basics of what our migrants do. Uh, it's very difficult to generalize, of course, there are lots of lots of species, but I'll make lots of generalisms, why not? Um, just to give you a flavor of what their lives are like in Africa and indeed why they go to Africa. And then after the break, I'm going to talk about why what I've been talking about in the first part, their behavior in Africa, on one level, is the key to their success but is also the key to their undoing. And so we begin to understand why they're declining. So if you want to tune out and go to sleep at this point, basically the whole punchline of the talk is that migrants are absolutely amazing. But if you like their amazingness is the reason that they're declining. Hopefully this will make sense to you. So first thing, our birds are actually African birds. Now this little diagram you see in front of you is for winchats. Uh, this is one of the species I've studied quite a bit. And it's just their year broken down in terms of time. And only 17% of a winchat's year is spent in Europe, or at least on the breeding ground uh, in Europe. Another 30% is spent migrating, about 5% of their whole annual budget is spent in flight, 12% stopping over, but 54%, i.e. over half of the time, they're actually in Africa. These are African birds. Here's another bird which will be very familiar to you. Hopefully you're all sitting there and I don't need to tell you that it's a white throat, it's a common white throat. This was photographed um, by my great friend in Crail, John Anderson, very good, good photographer, um, just a few hundred meters from my house. So this is this is down at Fife Ness. This is a female white throat, and it's breeding in a small bush down on the coastal path, um, quite gorsy habitat. Uh, it's arrived, say, second week in April, and it's left at the end of August. Where do they go in August? Well, they migrate, they head south, they head south uh, to Africa. And if you follow them, you'll find them 5,000, 6,000, seven and a half thousand kilometers away in a similar sort of scrubby bush, in a similar kind of habitat, doing exactly what they did during the breeding season. White throats are quite amazing are quite characteristic in the sense that they're a little bit like people with two homes. You might imagine that these migrants move over a very large spatial scale, that they have the world at their fingertips, but they don't in a way. They go, white throats in particular, go from one small bush that might be twice the size of, say, the room you're sitting in at the moment in uh, Europe, to the same size bush in Africa. And the fact that they may have 
joined up the dots in between, is almost immaterial. They have two homes. They're not actually globetrotters. You can think about people you probably know that have a second home in Tenerife. You'd hardly call them globetrotters. They just go between the two places. So what's the habitat like in Africa? Well, the more you travel in Africa, the more you realize that actually Africa is really Europe. It's just a bit drier. There's a huge lot of similarities and I feel very comfortable in British countryside. I feel very comfortable in African uh, countryside. Okay, the grass, as you can see here, uh, is a bit yellower. So this is central Nigeria. This is where I do a lot of my uh, research work in AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute. You've seen the sign in the last, uh, the last slide. So you've got scattered, scattered bushes in the background, you've got quite intensive uh, farmland, you've got isolated patches of woodland left, but it's essentially a very familiar uh, environment. I suspect not many of you have been to this particular part of Africa, but if I was to say to you, where would you find a white throat? You'll be thinking, well, okay, that bush down there in the foreground, that's where a white throat's gonna be because that's exactly where you'd find a white throat, uh, same kind of habitat uh, in uh, Europe. You'd be right. Now, very pertinent fact about understanding migrants in Africa is to understand the seasonality in Africa. Now, migrants, we all know, leave uh, Europe at the end of the summer as conditions get worse. They head to Africa where you imagine it's going to be much, much nicer. And yes, by and large, it is much, much nicer in the sense that you don't have short days, you don't have cold nights, and generally the environmental conditions are much more equitable. But you have a problem of drought. So Africa has a rainy season and a dry season. And in the northern parts of Africa, so above uh, the equator, where most of our Palearctic migrants are going, you've got a wet season that operates from about April through to the end of August. Now, if you're down south, say at the latitude in Nigeria of Lagos, then it rains pretty much all, all year round. But as you move north, the rainy season decreases and becomes less and less. And by the time you get up to the Sahara, I suppose you're in somewhere, uh, somewhere like the middle of Mali or some, uh, somewhere north of Niger, then that rainy season is compressed to only about six weeks or, or maybe two months uh, in the middle of the summer when things like white throats with us um, in the UK. So when the migrants get to Africa, they you've got on the left-hand side, side of the screen, they come to a post-rainy environment. It's been raining all summer. It's the beginning of our winter. It's stopped raining in most of the places, but there's lots and lots of greenery. There's lots of food. It's a great time to arrive, but it's stopped raining and it doesn't rain again until April. So it gets drier and drier through the year. And so the middle of the Middle of the slide here, you've got Sahelian woodland. So this is the very north of Nigeria where I took this, took this photo. Just imagine these are hawthorn trees. So again, this similarity of habitat uh, you've got, but they've got no leaves and of course no under understory uh, underneath. So the conditions are get, getting progressively worse. And when the migrants leave March, April time, it's almost the worst possible time in the sense that there's been a drought for the last four or five months. And in theory, there's relatively little food, but they've got to provision themselves and head off uh, back to Europe to breed. And another very important thing to understand about the habitat, I've kind of alluded to it already, is that there are a lot of people in Africa, and there's a lot of change in the habitats. So this is a typical area where I do my research, and this is what I call typical Africa. It's all very well to head off to glorious places like the middle of the rainforest, but actually what you're looking at is pretty much what Africa uh, is all about. Small farms 
and very little retained natural vegetation. It's a very kind of European uh, type of land, landscape. Ones that, and as I say, you, you feel quite at home, home with it, with this patch, patchwork of, of fields. Now, these habitats are very good for some African species. They're very bad for others, but they're generally very good for migrant species. And that's a, a wonderful thing because there are lots of people in Africa, there are going to be more people in Africa, and really it's quite encouraging to know that a lot of our migrants can coexist with people. So in this intensive bit of farmland that, that we're looking at, there might be yellow wagtails, it's got one uh, top left, there might be red-throated uh, pipits, there might be tree pipits, um, there'll be wind chats, uh, there'll be pallid harriers, a whole range of uh, palearctic species. And this particular species, the wind chat, is one I've been studying uh, for many years. Why wind chats? Because they're common and if you want to start to understand the ecology of the species, it's best to study something common. You don't spend all day trying to find it. They're easy to find and you can actually begin to understand how things work. You'll have noticed that this wind chat is perched in a tomato plant. So this is in a very intensive field. It's being irrigated um, every morning. Uh, there's a lot of pesticides going into it. There's a lot of um, fertilizer uh, going into it. But the wind chats are very happy in this field. I find some of the highest densities of wind chats um, in Africa in these kind of fields. But we need to really get to the nitty gritty of what migrants are doing. So we need to catch them and we need to turn them into individuals. It's all very well to see a wind chat in the field, but unless we have a marked individual, we don't know the range it's using. We don't know if it's coming back to the same place each year. We don't know its probability of coming back. And so its survival rate, we don't know where it's come from and so on. So all of this should be familiar with. This is uh, basic ringing, basic ornithology. And it's surprising how little basic ornithology has been done in Africa. And I'll return to it, uh, to this right at the end, end of the talk and what we can do about it. It's not rocket science. You put up nest nets, you catch birds, and here's my uh, colleague, Ulf Otterson. Um, he's, I think he's actually got a village weaver that he's uh, weighing. We've got lots of colorings there. And we're turning population into individuals so we can start joining the dots and finding out about things like survival. And uh, you'll notice that um, Ulf takes his anti-malaria very seriously. He's got his bottle of gin. Uh, on the table there. Although when I uh, uh, tried to make this joke to a Scottish audience, a, a lady piped up from the back and said, it's not the gin, it's the tonic. So she'd obviously had correct experience. And of course, um, Ulf, uh, he's not drinking on the job, he's collecting blood samples. An old gin bottle is perfect for uh, putting your, um, your discarded charts after you've taken a blood sample. So we've called a wind chat um, and we put colorings on. Colorings are fantastic. I'm not a great fan of catching birds. What makes birds wonderful to me are the freedom, the fact that they move, they fly away, they're hard to see and identify. Once you've caught a bird and it's in your hand, it's kind of a bit dull. But if you catch a bird, you can turn it into an individual. So this um, wind chat, you work left to right on the leg and you work top to bottom. So this is green metal, lime metal, white, orange. And I might catch another wind chat, next wind chat, and instead of it being lime metal, white, orange, it would be lime metal, white, blue. And you keep on varying the combinations. And before you know it, you've got several hundred individual birds and everything then changes in terms of what you can find out and what uh, what you can study. So you can start finding out how they use space, both on a small scale and on a large scale. So let's look at the small scale. So this is a, um, a satellite photo of northern Nigeria, just very close to the border with Niger, and there's a wheatear on the left-hand side, which is colouring, and what you've got here are 
lots and lots of locations of wheat ears, individually coloring wheat ears that they've been released and then you go out the next day and you record with a GPS where they are. So you can begin to map the territories. And after a while, you can get enough sightings, you get a reasonable idea of the space that they're using. And the first thing that strikes you is they really don't get around much. Now, these are wheat ears, northern wheat ears, that have probably bred in somewhere like Greenland, heaven forbid, Siberia. They've come a long way. They are incredible global migrants. Some wheat ears, as you know, breed in Alaska, migrate all the way down uh, to East Africa incredibly long migrations. But once they get there, they're barely moving. Look at the scale there, 100 meters. That's nothing. And look at those little territories that are there. So a wheat ear is operating. You can look at the left-hand slide. There are some camels in the background just to, to uh, show you that, yep, we were definitely close to the Sahara. Um, there's a rock in the middle there, a couple of rocks to the left of it. And there's a little acacia in the back. That's the scale over which they're moving. That's a wheat ear territory. Incredible. You know, it might have come 12,000 kilometers, but once it's got here, it's not really going very far. Does this apply to other migrant species? Well, let's have a look at white throats. So white throats are a bit more skulking than wheat ears. You can just sit with a telescope and watch wheat ears hopping about. Uh, white throats disappear into bushes. So you need something a little bit more sophisticated. You can see on the left what we've, we've put a radio tag on, a little antenna coming off it. This is a, a new generation tag which has got a little solar panel on it. We were testing it out. Unfortunately, we found that because white throats go into bushes, they don't get much sunlight coming through. So the effective range of these tags is, is fairly limited, but that's how we find out and how we innovate. Anyway, you track a white throat and top right, you've got Mohammed, um, a master student at uh, Aplori. I'll come back, to, come back to that at the end of the talk. He's living the dream. He's doing his research project, tracking wild animals. Only trouble is the card he's been dealt is common white throat. And common white throats, as I've already told you, they really don't do much if they're even less glamorous than wheat is because they're skulking in the middle of a bush. Now, Mohammed would go out every day and record diligently all the white throats that we've got radio tagged and their location. And he'd come back in the evening fairly despondent and say, Will, Will, I think they're all dead. They're just not moving. They're always in the same bushes. And I said, have faith, Mohammed. As my PhD supervisor told me, good negative data. One morning, though, I was teaching at the Institute and Mohammed comes running into the lecture theater. He goes, Will, 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 it's moved, it's moved. So I'm all very excited, the class, and I run outside, run down the hill with Mohammed to where the white throats moved to from its bush. But of course, by the time we got there, the white throat had gone back. It had done a spectacular movement of about 300 meters and then gone back to its bush. It's proof of life. Um, at least. Another species, wind chats. Um, what you've got here are locations of, in the similar way recorded uh, with the wheat ears, uh, obviously wind chats are much more visible open habitats, so they can just put colorings on them. Now they don't really have circular territories. What I've, what I've done is just plotted the center of all the locations and just join them with a line. So you've got a rough idea of the scale of the territory. And again, look at the scale with respect to 100 meters, tiny, tiny territories. So that bottom right photo there is the scale at which you might expect to find two to three wind chats uh, in Africa. And they're zipping between bushes, 50, 75 meters or, or so on, but it's a very small scale. Now this begs the question, they come all this way to a bush or a little group of bushes, and then they go back to Europe to breed. And if they're alive, and 
a lot of them are alive, they've got a 50% on average survival rate, do they come back to exactly the same little place? So this is wind chats in the second season, and this is the same wind chats in the first season with it um, superimposed. So you can see straightforward answer to the question, do they come back to the same place is yes, they come back to exactly the same place. Now you've got some small lack of overlap between the circles, but remember the scale we're talking, those overlaps are only, you know, sort of 10 to 20 meters uh, difference. And that's well within, if you like, uh, measurement um, error or just kind of chance. Basically, if you've got a wheat ear on a bush and that bush, is, sorry, wind chats on a bush, and that bush is still there the following year, you'll find the wind chat on it. And if the bush isn't there the following year, the wind chat will be still there, but it'll just be perched a little bit lower. And this really begs an interesting question, because if you can operate on the scale of a planet, so a wind chat might have bred in Finland, and then migrated all the way down to, say, somewhere in Liberia, a huge distance, and it comes back to a bush, and it finds that its neighbour hasn't come back. Remember, I said that 50% survival rate. So on average, half of your neighbours haven't come back. You've managed to come back. You're sat on your bush, and you look to the right of you, and there's an empty territory. And you look to the left of you and there's another empty territory and you've come 8,000 kilometers. So why don't you move 100 meters either right or left? Because what's the chance that you had the best territory to begin with? Odds are you probably didn't and that one of the territories to either the right or left or even a little bit further away is better than the one you've got. But they don't move. It's quite fantastic. They don't move. A wind chat can be occupying a field of maize in one year, and the following year, there is no field of maize there. There's no cover. It's just open, bare grassland, perhaps a fallow field, but the wind chat still comes back to the same place and it doesn't move, even though it has the opportunity to move, I would argue, to, to um, slightly better uh, territories. So why? Why would you not move? And then when you think about it, you start to gain an understanding of why migrants actually go to Africa, because Africa is very, very easy. And you don't need to be fussy and you don't need to work hard once you get to Africa because it's always warm, it doesn't get cold, you don't have long nights and there's always food. And if you watch things like wheat ears or wind chats feeding, you start first, first light in the morning, takes them half an hour to kind of get going and start feeding. So half past seven in the morning, they start feeding. By half past day in the morning, it's pretty much all over. A wind chat that's having a bad day feeds until nine o'clock in the morning and then siestas for pretty much for the rest of the day. So why don't wind chats move when they can? It's because they can't be bothered. Stick with what you know. And this is important. And remember what I said about the shift in the quality of the habitat through the season. So this is the top left. You've got the habitat in September, wind chats. And this is what the habitat looks like in March, wind chats. The wind chats are still there, but you can see the quality of the environment is massively changed. There's much less vegetation, there's much less opportunities uh, for insects. It's much less lush, it's much less hospitable. But the wind chats are still there. And by and large, all the other microbes are still there. There's a degree of movement, I'll come, I'll come on to that. But the point is that they're not fussy. So what does a migrant need in its territory? What do they actually need in Africa? This is looking at it again from the wind chat's point of view, and looking at how the size of territory varies with shrub density. Now wind chats like perches, 
and you might expect a good territory to have lots of perches in it so they can survey the ground, drop down and pick up insects. So we've got a lot of variation uh, in shrub density across territories, which suggests again they're not that fussy. But look at the variation in their territory size. So okay, a bird that's got loads of shrubs might have a territory diameter of about 50 meters, and one that's barely got any shrubs, their territory diameter might be 100 meters. Now ecologically, that's quite a big difference in terms of area, but in terms of a wind chat moving over the spatial scale of 50 meters or 100 meters, it's absolutely trivial. So pretty much any kind of territory will do. And we looked at this in detail. What makes wind chats happy? We looked at the food availability, we looked at the quality of the vegetation, all sorts of things, you know, that you can imagine are very, very important to birds. The only thing that came out very strongly was perches. Wind chats just like to have somewhere to sit to forage. So you could almost go into a bare area of field, stick a few bamboo canes in it, and that's a good wind chat territory. Because as I said earlier, it's not about food quality because the wind chat can just push its foraging effort up a little bit and feed until nine o'clock in the morning. So wind chats aren't fussy and by and large most migrants are not fussy, they're generalists. Now let me just explain this diagram. I've got a few graphs in this talk and I hope, hope you won't, won't feel uh, annoyed by uh, that. All graphs are effectively the same, although this one is a slight, a slight variation on the more normal graph. So what you've got here is a frequency distribution and what we're interested in is how wide or how pointed these distributions are. Because if you look along a gradient, so I've got two gradients here, I've got plant diversity and I've got degree of shrubbiness in territories. And if you then plot how often wind chats occur across this gradient, if wind chats are specialists, you expect peaks. You know, they really only like a particular plant diversity, then you only find them, say, in the middle of the distribution. But if they don't care about plant diversity, you'll find them all over the range, the gradient. So what we're looking for are peaks, or we're looking for nice flatter curves. Flatter curves indicate that the species is a generalist species, and the points indicate that they're specialist. By and large, you plot these out for migrants, you find that over a whole range of conditions, you find the migrant species, you find these flat curves, not these pointy curves, i.e. they're generalists and not specialists. So are migrants fussy generally? So remember, specialist species are gonna have these peaks and generalist species are gonna have the pink, the more flatter, lower curves. They're going to occur at even density across whatever habitat characteristic that you're looking at. So what we tried to do was to, across a range of Palearctic migrants in Africa, measure their occurrence across these gradients to see whether we got the spikes or whether we got the flat, the flat curves, and then compare them to those African species, which are very, very generalist. So there are a number of Afrotropical species that occur everywhere. You go birding in Nigeria, you go birding in Uganda, you go birding in South Africa, you'll find these species. Pipits, um, certain types of uh, cysticulus, for example, greyback uh, cysticula, uh, a species of wattle eye, it'll be slightly different where you go, but ecologically it'll be the, be the same uh, species. They are true habitat generalists, as far as you can find any species. So those are our control group. And what we're doing is comparing the distribution of the Palearctic migrants to these ubiquitous uh, species across Africa. So what you've got are three, if you like, habitat gradients. One is habitat quality. 
Other is habitat location. So this is north, south distribution, latitudinal distribution. And habitat disturbance is a measure of how much human uh, disturbance is going on, you know, whether it's farmland, whether it's being set fire to, whether it's being grazed, whether it's firewood is being extracted, all put together into a composite score. And the bottom graphs show the distribution. What we're looking for is more peaks in one group than the other to see which one's more specialist. And by and large, we find that are pretty similar. Palearctic migrants, yellow wagtails, tree pipits, winchats, wheatears are generalists in Africa. They occur over a wide range of habitats equivalent to those African species that we regard as being very, very generalist. Except in one respect, migrants are more generalist than African species in terms of latitudinal distribution. So they occur over a wider range uh, within Africa. So on average, and please remember I'm generalizing, so of course there are exceptions, there are specialist migrant species, but on average most migrant species are very generalist. Now when I started doing research in Africa, I used to get very upset with these kind of graphs because I would go out for months at a time to Africa and do lots and lots of hard field work of measuring ecological conditions and measuring the density of these uh, bird species. And then I'd plot the graph and end up with a shocking relationship like this. So this is the change in density of white throats with the change in density of trees. So I've done a survey in one year, come back five years later, and all the trees have been chopped down, or in some areas they've regenerated and grown up again. So it's like a natural experiment. And what I'm expecting is to find nice relationships that allow me to predict the habitat specificity of white throats, i.e. white throats need this amount of habitat in the Sahel, so we need to conserve habitat like this to conserve populations of white throat. But instead, what I find are these really, really flat graphs. And for years and years, I felt like a complete failure before it finally clicked that that was it. Of course, I would find these flat graphs because they're generalist species. So yes, there are habitats that white throats need. Yes, they need bushes, they need scrubby habitats, but they can deal with very, very dense bushy habitats and very, very open sparse habitats as well. So you end up with these very flat relationships. So this means that these migrant species should be very, very resilient to habitat change. So even though there are lots of people changing the habitat, reducing the amount of habitat, there are still going to be migrants there. There'll be fewer migrants, and if the habitat's really good, um, there's lots of bushes for the white throats, but there'll still be white throats. And by and large, if you look at a whole range of um, migrant species, I've got two, two more here. We've got subalpine warbler, not a, not a, a British species, but a very common species uh, across Europe that you find all over the Sahel, and less of white throat. And these shallow bird habitat relationships are fairly common. So subalpine warbler is a great example. They like, you find the highest densities where there are lots of acacias. You remove the acacias, you will get rid of a lot of subalpine warblers. But even at very low acacia density, you still have subalpine warblers. So it's the difference between three per hectare and one per hectare. But Africa is enormous. And there is lots and lots and lots of habitat. There's more habitat than there is in Europe. And these birds don't need to breed either. They just need to tick over and survive. So there's a lot of space for these birds. Another very interesting thing that in the second part of the talk, I'll hopefully sort of square the circle and um, make sense of is that the density of the migrants is also very variable. If you look at, say, wind chat density across crops, you find there's some variation, but not a massive amount of variation. It's not very significant. 
You look across sites, however, that apparently have the same habitat, you can find significant variation. And if you look across winters, you can find even more variation. So some winters you might have a high density of wind chats in an area, and in another winter you have a very low density. And it's not as simple as well, they're having a good breeding season or a bad breeding season, because you can find an area with a high density in one winter and a low density the following winter and the reverse pattern in an area that's immediately adjacent to it. So again, this seems hard, quite hard to explain until you start thinking that perhaps Africa is very, very large and there is lots of space for these migrants. They're not crammed to the gunnels at their carrying capacity all the time. So there is room for, for variation, other things to drive variation. So what we need to do is to start trying to understand these things on a bigger spatial scale and also to link what's happening in Africa to what's happening um, on uh, the breeding grounds. How do we do this? We need to tag birds. Here's a wind chat which has got a geolocator on its back. So this is a tag which weighs about 0.5 of a gram. Now the lightest wind chat that you might you might catch um, in Africa about 14 grams, 14 and a half. So that 0.5 of a gram represents about four or five percent of body weight. And that's about the limit of anything you ever want to attach to a flying bird. I've tested this using different weights of tags, different harness attachments, different lengths of the little stalk that I'll explain in a second from it to see how much difference it makes to their survival compared to birds that just have color rings, just let's say the blue rings there. And we, I couldn't detect um, any significant survival decrements. That doesn't mean that if you put tags on badly or inappropriately, that you won't mess up a bird. That's certainly true. But if you do it carefully and with consideration, uh, you can actually find out what birds do properly without interfering with their behavior. Nevertheless, I don't expect there's any winter in the world that enjoyed having a geolocator on them. But the information that you gain from it is quite fantastic. So what you've got here, the white thing sticking at the bottom is a light stalk because what geolocators do is they record light. Every couple of minutes they just record whether it's light or not. So you've then got a record of sunrise and sunset because if it's dark, 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 light, sun's risen, light, 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 dark, sunset. Okay, it's gone down a hole, but you know, that's, you can work, you can work it out. Um, and if you have a clock, you can then work out where your bird is on the planet, except, of course, when it's the equinox, because then you've got equal day length um, wherever you are, from the North Pole to the South Pole. Migration time happens to be around the equinox for many species, it happens to be the end of March or happens to be at the end, end of September, which is very, very irritating for those of us that use uh, geolocators. But there are limitations. The fact is we have to put this incredibly light thing on a bird and the information is stored within a chip on the bird. It doesn't transmit it. That would add too much weight. These are not satellite tags. So we have to recapture the bird. So you put your geolocators on and then the bird migrates back to Europe and then it migrates back to Africa, and I've already explained to you, they come back to exactly the same bush. This wouldn't work if they didn't, because you have to recatch the bird to uh, get the uh, tag back. So uh, you've got Malcolm, Ben, and Aaron, crack team. Um, we've just seen a, one of our returning wind chats uh, in one of these intensive tomato uh, fields, and we're going to try and catch it. If only it was so easy. Archival tags are the biggest pain you can possibly imagine because birds are very clever. 
they're really clever. And you catch a bird once, it learns very rapidly the circumstances with which it was caught and how to avoid it. Mist netting seems like a wonderful thing. Oh, I'm always catching birds when I mist net. You're not catching the same birds. Birds avoid mist nets when they've been caught. Now, how do you get around this? Well, on the right hand side, you've got a bird caught in a spring trap. Now, spring traps are brilliant for wind chats. They're just little fold over um, squares of netting with a spring secured with a little stick with a piece of wire coming out of the stick with a maggot on attached between two bits of wire. The wind chat thinks maggot, fantastic. It flies down, pecks at the maggot, which dislodges the stick and whack. The net comes over the bird. You can catch a wind chat in about 10 seconds. It's absolutely wonderful. It's incredible. If you've ever been, if you're a bird ringer and you've been out mist netting, you know how difficult it is. These um, spring traps for small chats, absolutely brilliant. But you'll never ever catch a wind chat a second time in a spring trap because once they've been caught, and they don't really enjoy the experience, even though you've got them out of the net within um, another 10 seconds, you've ringed them and let them go in another two minutes, they remember it. And I've tried this on a whole variety of uh, chats and there's maybe one in 400 birds that repeatedly goes into a spring trap. Are they clever? They realize they get a free maggot each time for just some moderate handling or are they stupid? I don't know. But in terms of trying to recatch my wind chats, it's a huge problem. So what we do in one year in, before they migrate, so March time, um, we'll catch them in a mist net because you don't, you're not too bothered about what you catch the first time. Any wind chat will do. So this sort of hit and miss method of mist netting is better. And then when they return in September, October, we use our spring traps. And if you get it that order the right way around, then it, it can be very, very efficient. You see your bird, it's got its color rings on, you know it's still got a tag on it. This bird is incredibly valuable and you have to, have to be able to catch it. Now the central photo is one of our um, geolocator tagged wind chats and looks a bit blurry behind it. That's because it's looking at a mist net. And I've explained to you how straightforward it is, mist net and then spring trap and seems fairly obvious. But why wouldn't you do anything else? But we learned the hard way because we did the spring trap first and then we tried the mist net. And, um, anyway, quite a few birds outwitted us. But you catch them and it's an incredibly exciting moment. This bird has been away and you've got it back and you're checking the colorings. Yeah, that's the one you wanted. It's still got its tag on. Now these tags are attached. You can see this sort of, it's lycra harness. So it's expandable. It's probably quite a comfortable harness to wear, but you don't put it, put it on too tightly. You put it on just right. But of course they can come off or they can break and you can catch your bird and you can find it's dropped its tag and that's heartbreaking. Anyway, they've got the tag, you've got the tag, hand shaking, cutting it off. The bird's fine. You've got the tag. It's absolutely brilliant because within this tag is the bird's journey over the last few months. And this photo I show you represents absolute happiness of field work. So I'm in Nigeria. I've been out for the last two, three hours catching wind chats. On the left hand side, you can see there's a tag with the red and blue lead, uh, red and black leads attached to it, plugged into my computer. I'm downloading the data in my computer screen. I've got lots and lots of little numbers coming out. It's got data in it because sometimes you download the tag and the battery's failed or it's only collected data for a week or it's not working. And so I've got data, I've got a cup of tea, and I've also got a donut. What could be better? When you download these tags, you have to do a bit of processing, but what comes out is absolutely incredible. These snapshots of these incredible journeys. Now we know that they migrate from Europe to Africa, but you really need to look at their individual tracks to really see how fantastic that is. So 
On the left-hand side, you've got a wind chat that I tracked from Liberia. And so it stopped a um, little bit on, on its return migration, location one, just gone a little bit um, further north. It's still within well-vegetated zone uh, south of the, the deserts, probably um, fueling up. Then it crosses the desert. Uh, it may stop in the desert, but it's only stopping for a few hours just to have a sleep, probably um, um, just at the end of the day. And then it makes it across the Sahara, flights about two, two and a half days uh, to cross the Sahara, mostly non-stop flying, and then they fuel up again. So this is uh, Algeria. Um, sorry, I tracked the autumn thing. So three, it's in Morocco, right up on the coast. So there'll be vegetation. It, it's the spring. It's after the rains in Morocco. So there should be good fueling. It's stopped again in northern Spain, number four. Then we've got another uh, stop, stop oversight just on the uh, German-Polish border. And then it's breeding up in Finland, above the Arctic Circle. This was a fantastic surprise uh, to me. Uh, you look in the books about their wind chat distribution. Yeah, we know they go far north, but they're actually breeding in the very high Arctic. So they'll be uh, breeding next to you know, redneck, uh, redneck phalaropes, uh, long-tailed skewers, quite, quite incredible. And these are birds that I caught in a clearing in a rainforest. That's what I mean about these fantastic journeys actually having the tags and getting this information and having the reality that this little bird, what it's actually done as an individual. So anyway, it's bred, bred north of the Arctic Circle, finishes, finishes breeding end, end of July, then makes its journey, journey back, one big stopover um, in Poland, then um, it's moved over to the Polish coast, and then another quick migration across the um, Mediterranean, refueling again in Algeria before heading all the way down back to its starting point in Liberia. How long does it take to get from Liberia up to, uh, sorry, I said Finland, it's actually Russia, but very close. Um, about two to three weeks. The quickest migration that I've had for a wind chat from central Nigeria to near Moscow was 12 days. 12 days, six and a half thousand kilometers. Just incredible for an average 14 gram bird. Although of course, when they migrate, they've put on another 14 grams of fat, 28 grams, quite, quite incredible. Imagine you tried to swim with a backpack full of bricks. This is the equivalent to a windshack flying, I think when it's doubled its body weight. The bird on the right, it's one tagged from Nigeria much shorter, my, uh, shorter migration, but the, the same kind of thing. But notice there's a second site that it uses. So it comes back to a different area of Africa before it returns to the original, uh, original place where I caught it. You put a lot of tags on birds, you end up with a lot of, a lot of tracks and each one is an individual adventure, but you can start making some generalizations. So wind chats, some wind chats just cross the desert directly. Some other wind chats go to other areas in the spring to fuel up before they cross the, cross the desert. Um, wind chats can cross the desert and stop, or they can cross the desert and the Mediterranean and stop. By stop, I mean stopping for two or three days to reef, or more than two or three days. Some wind chats do it continuously. So they must migrate. Uh, for a day, stop, feed for a few hours, migrate for another day, stop, feed for a few hours, migrate, and so on. They might stop for one day here or one day there, but they're much more continuous. And it's, it's really interesting to wonder whether these are better birds, whether they've got the wind behind them. Uh, the level of tags we have at the moment, it, we can't say, we don't have the resolution. We really need real-time tracking, things like satellite. Um, tags, but of course these birds are too, are too small. As you tag these birds and you start 
um, to build up sample sizes, you start to get an idea of some of the general ecology. So this is common white throats. These were um, the first common white throats that were tagged um, year before last uh, by one of my PhD students, uh, Claudia. And so they're ringed in central Nigeria and tagged and they migrate to Northern Europe, same kind of area to where the wind chats were going to, but they're spread over a very large area. So even though we catch these common white throats from more or less the same little clump of bushes in Africa, they're spread over a huge area of Africa, uh, of Europe to breed. And after migration, uh, after breeding, they migrate down to the edge of the Sahara, so quite a bit further north from where we caught them originally in Africa, and spend a month or four weeks, four to six weeks in the Sahel region across a similar area. You notice that the area looks smaller in Africa than it does in Europe. That's a, an illusion of the projection. It's actually a slightly larger area um, that they're, they're spread across. Remember, Africa is enormous. It just looks small because of our Euro, Eurocentric projections of, of maps. So white throats have got three areas. They've got a breeding area, they've got a first wintering area, and then they've got a second wintering area. And we've been looking at white throats in detail and some birds have more than that. They might have a third or a fourth wintering area, but they're very site faithful to these difficult, uh, to these different areas. Um, sorry, my dog is moaning underneath the sofa. <laughs> if there you hear strange noises. And this pattern of very wide spread seems to be quite common. Uh, for migrants. So of the uh, 26 wind chats in, sorry, 29 wind chats in this early study that we did, we found they were spread across 2,100 kilometers of Europe. And if you express that in terms of area, one third of the area of Europe was covered by wind chats that we tagged within 40 square kilometers oh. of Africa. So they're spreading out a great deal. Turn that up the other way, that means that wind chats from one place in Scotland are spread out over a large part of Africa. So if you look at connectivity across a whole range of species, so what I've got plotted here are all the tracks that I could find published from 101 land bird species. So that's 1,813 tracks, things like snow buntings, swift, swallows, honey buzzards, wheat ears. And you've got their point of origin and then where they spread out to. And I think this is, this is sort of um, nature and science becoming an art uh, in a way. Each of these lines, is a fantastic, incredible journey that has been, has been uh, tracked. So you'll see there are some biases. There's lots of work gone on in the Americas, lots gone in Europe. There's much, relatively little uh, that's gone on in Asia. But by and large, these species appear to fly south and spread out. And again, if you feel like uh, tuning out, and I'll stop for a break in just a, just a second, um, birds fly south for winter and they spread out. Basically, my granny could have told me the answer before I started this uh, research. Some of it's quite incredible. This is Great Reed Warbler, one of the champions in terms of spreading out during migration. So eight Great Reed Warblers were caught in the same net in um, Denmark, and they then spread out over 3,250 kilometers of Africa. So imagine the situation, you've got a little nature reserve in Denmark where you're interested in conserving great reed warblers and you're thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could save their wintering grounds? Well, their wintering grounds is Africa. You tag these birds, you find out they go to Africa. You might find the specific place they go, but you tag enough of them, basically they go to Africa. And a lot of our tracking studies have basically just found they go to Africa. And if you look at 
the predictors of the spread, the connectivity, excuse me, I'm just going to have to let the dog out. The perils of Zoom, uh, Zoom presentation. Um, if you factor in the latitude of where these birds breed and the, uh, the location and see what predicts the degree of spread in any of the populations, you find that geography, i.e. the latitude and longitude, the availability of land is a better predictor, predicting 38% of the variation, how they spread out compared to individual species. And this is from a data set that includes things as different as swifts, as bee eaters, nightingales, um, wheat ears, honey buzzards, pretty much the range, harriers, uh, Montague's harrier, pallid harrier. So there's a huge amount of ecology there, but actually what predicts where they end up in Africa or America is just, is there land there? So if it's going to winter in say Central America, it's not gonna have a wide range because there's not much land. But if it winters in Amazonia, it'll have a wide range because there's lots of land there. So back to this point of generalists and being unfussy birds, migrants fly south and they basically spread out over all available uh, land. And you can predict the spread by geography really well. And it's easiest if you imagine this just by rotating the world round. So you've got a graph here and one of these graphs where you've got a, a peak. So you've got a maximum spread halfway down the planet and then you've got a limited spread higher up the planet and a limited spread below the planet. Uh, at the lower part of the planet. And if you look at the distribution of land, that's exactly what you have. Now there's very variation uh, in here. Individual species do vary in the degree to which they spread out. But by and large, geography gets you. Uh, so on average, and this is the punchline, and then we'll break, um, individuals from any population are spread out over continental wide scales in the non-breeding season. So when you go uh, for a coffee or a com comfort break, just sort of think, think about the things that, that I've said, said so far, because what I will try and do in the second part of the talk is to link all of it together, the fact that they're not fussy, they spread out, and that they're generalists, to the fact that they're declining because almost everything I've said so far would suggest they shouldn't be declining at all. These are fantastically successful, versatile, flexible, resilient, able to do anything species, yet they're declining. So we shall uh, break now and I will stop sharing at this point. So just to summarize what I was, was talk, talking about um, before, we've got these two things happening. I talked about really high sight fidelity, about how birds go back to the same place each year uh, in Africa. But then I also said something that kind of contradicted it about how they spread out kind of like almost at random across the whole available space. So how does that kind of like square together? Well, imagine a brood of wheat ears and you've got a brood of, say, four or five, and they spread out all over Africa, like those great reed warblers caught, caught in, the, in the same net. And then, sorry, I'm trying, there we go. What happens? Some of those individuals survive. They've gone to a good place. Others don't. The wee two that's flown out into the Atlantic, that's it. It's toast. It doesn't make it back. So 
they return to Europe, they breed, and then when they fly down to Africa again, they go back to where it worked, where it allowed them to survive. Stick with what you know. Remember the wind chats that didn't change territories, even 100 meters, because it worked for them last winter. They survived. Stick with what you know. It's uncertainty that kills you. So what you've got is repetition of survivable routes. But initially, those routes are a bit kind of random. So why would you do that? Now, this is what I've called the serial residency hypothesis. So this is low connectivity, i.e. spread out over a wide area, but you then have high site fidelity once you've located a suitable area. So juveniles just kind of head off to Africa. They fly south. Where they end up, who knows? Those that end up in a good place, and there's a degree of, you know, they can search around, but on a continental scale, they're kind of hitting and hoping. And then if they find a place that works, i.e. they survive, they then repeat that um, the next year. Now, why would you do this? Why would you follow these two rules? The answer is climate change, but not climate change in a bad way, climate change in a good way. Migrants are supremely adapted to climate change. Now we hear about climate emergency, climate change, uh, but within the context of Africa, there's a huge amount of climate change, natural climate change. Within the context of the globe over the last thousands of years, there's a huge amount of climate change. And migrants are essentially an adaptation to climate change. They follow the seasons across the planet and those seasons vary. Now, climate change often think of as a bad thing. And in the context of a drought in the Sahel, so this is a photo from the 90s, in the, uh, sorry, late 80s in the Sahel, um, it looks really grim. And this paper, 2005, I remember I read it, just made me feel very, very unhappy because it predicted rainfall in the Sahel brilliantly in the past. And then they extended their predictions in the future. And as you can see, it went down and down and down. It's gonna, it was bad and it was gonna get worse. I was very unhappy. Next year, I read this paper. It predicted exactly the opposite. It was a brilliant model, just like the other one, published in a very, very good journal. Very good at predicting what happened in the past, showing, uh, matching what happened in the past, extend that into the future. And actually it's gonna rain more. The Sahara is gonna turn into a, a verdant land according to this model. So this cheered me up. And then I came across this one, which averaged all of these climate prediction papers for the region. And basically there's no agreement as to whether the Sahel will be drier or wetter. My climate change colleagues, learned as they are, are basically just arguing backwards and forth. We have absolutely no idea whether it will get drier or wetter in the Sahel into the future. On average, it looks like it's not going to change. Of course, it, of course, it's going to change. We have no idea with our best meteorological, scientific, predictive models what the climate's going to do. So how does a wheat ear know? How does a wind chat know? They have no idea. So it's good to hedge your bets. That's why you spread out. Have a look at this. This is seasonal rainfall in uh, Africa got great data sets running down to about 1800 of rainfall in Africa. And where you see the black dots, it's raining. Where you see white dots, it's dry. 1950 to 1959, 1960 to 1969, go back. Look, the pattern of rainfall has changed on a continental scale in 10 years. Go forward another decade. It's changed again, completely different pattern. It's changed again. Rain climate in Africa is all over the place. If you're a wheat ear heading down to Africa, you've got no idea whether Senegal is going to be better than Liberia, is going to be better than Nigeria, is going to be better than Mauritania, it's going to be better than Uganda. If the climate's changing on a sort of decadal basis, then if the climate was good last year, it's probably a reasonable predictor the climate will be good the next year, not in 10 years time. So you have the evolutionary spreading out, but in terms of 
what an individual should do, it should probably repeat what it did the previous year. So that's how the two things square, this spreading out randomness with this high site fidelity, because it's due with different temporal scales operating. And if any of you have flown over the Sahara, fantastic experience, get a window seat. If you're flying over the Sahara, look down, you will see riverbeds, riverbeds almost everywhere. Some areas you've got the dunes, whatever, and the camels, but most of it, Sahara looks like this. And you can see the riverbeds. You can see the trees along the riverbeds. And if you cross the Sahara and you start digging around in these riverbeds, you'll find hippo bones. Only five and a half thousand years ago, there were hippos all the way across the Sahara. There was a lot of rainfall in the Sahara. So our migrant birds were crossing the Sahara then when things were much better, they're crossing the Sahara now when things aren't. That's what migrants are used to. Now, if you think you've got shifting conditions, remember that shifting rainfall pattern in Africa. You're a willow warbler heading down to Africa. Your offspring are going out in a scattergun formation. Some of your offspring or some of the population will hit ideal conditions. So the blue circle in here. And if that shifts, say next decade, some of your population, some of your offspring will still hit the target and they will be able to make return journey. So this widespread connectivity, this low connectivity is an adaption to shifting climate. It's a very, very good thing for a migrant to be. So if you have a conservation strategy of looking after sites, then that will work because as long as you've got them over a sufficient scale to cover this climatic variation. But really what you need is conservation over a much larger scale. Think of those great reed warblers over the whole of Africa. So migrants are absolutely amazing. They have this fantastic resilience and they're supremely adapted to climate change, which we at the moment are thinking is the big engine of biodiversity destruction. Yet migrants are declining. If you compare populations of resident species in UK or Europe to populations of migrants, doesn't matter how you slice it up, migrants on average are declining compared to resident species. And these declines are not trivial. If you look at a whole range of species, migrants are actually disappearing before our eyes. Spotted flycatcher. Spotted flycatchers have declined by 85% in my lifetime in the UK. When I was a bird watcher, starting to, to bird watch at the age of about 13, um, I lived in Hertfordshire, used to remember visiting my aunt in a cottage hospital, remember them, they're also extinct. Um, and when you're 13 years old, sitting for two hours on a Sunday afternoon, talking to an elderly aunt is, is fairly grim. And I used to look out the window a lot and watch the spotted flycatchers on the wire, uh, on the, the sort of you know, rough, rough grass garden um, field fringe at the back of the hospital. And it was the absolute joy to me. Those spotted flycatchers are long gone now. So many of um, spotted flycatchers, other migrants, house, house martins, cuckoos, and so on, they're still there, but in much, much lower numbers. Northern wheat is the species which is most, most declining, did you know? Um, we've probably lost half the European population, millions upon millions of northern wheat is. They're still common, but that's because they were very common. Common red starts used to be the commonest species in the Netherlands. Used to be in everybody's gardens. They're now actually very, very scarce in the Netherlands or in restricted habitats. So why? Why are they declining? Well, it's probably to do with habitat change. Now I've argued that these migrants are very resilient to habitat change, but only to a point. If you remove habitat, if you turn a wood into a car park, then you don't have white throats anymore. 
So it's the same, roughly the same kind of thing. Woods being chopped down, turned into farmland, and there's a huge human population um, explosion in Africa. Some of the highest rates of human population are increasing in countries like uh, Nigeria, um, Uganda, where migrants are concentrated. And although the migrants are resilient to habitat change, they are not unaffected by it. So they're very common, but they're becoming less common because you're degrading and removing habitat. Now, this is a natural experiment that was very satisfying to me as a scientist, but actually very depressing as a conservationist and a human being. So watch Cobb, that little uh, dot top right I visited in 1993 a lovely piece of Sahelian woodland one of the nicest places I've ever visited it's now in a part of Nigeria that you cannot visit um, and go <laughs> escape with your life it's where Boko Haram are camp camped out uh, at the moment 1993 absolutely love lovely place fell in love with working in Africa there lots of acacias lots of subalpine warblers and we visited a range of sites with different tree densities and I made this model to predict subalpine density in terms of tree density. Nice model, high predictive value, lovely. But a test of any model, this is just correlation, would be to actually experimentally manipulate the tree density and see if subalpine wall has changed. Well, I had that experience by going back to watch call in 2001 too, so the, the red square down there, and I found most of the trees had been chopped down and there were fewer subalpine warblers. So yes, great, my model works, but I'd rather, rather it perhaps wasn't, wasn't the case. Still lots of subalpine warblers, but many fewer. So back to the scattergun model, the serial residency thing. Imagine that birds are flying out, but instead of the target shifting, the target is getting smaller and it's getting smaller each year. So the proportion of the population that survives, hits the target or has a higher survival rate because they found good habitat is lower each year. And that's not shifting, it's decreasing. So bet hedging um, is a very poor adaptation to habitat loss. It's a great adaptation to climate change. So climate change is pushing the birds to be spread out evolutionarily, whereas habitat loss pushes them the other way. And you're familiar with the phrase, the rock and the hard place, which is where migrants are. Because climate change is adapting them one way, whereas human removal of habitat is pushing them the other way. And I won't, I won't bore you too, too much with uh, another graph, but if you look for the signs of whether a population is decreasing or not, if it's spread out or not spread out, you can get at whether habitat change or climate change is most important. And you find that it's beneficial to be more spread out as a population, as a species in the Americas, and it's the other way around in Africa. So in America, what's driving migrant declines on average is climate change. In Africa, it's habitat change. And if you look at the population demographics and you also look at the climate the history of climate change, it all fits together because Africa's had loads of climate change. It's always had climate change. So the migrants are good at that, but it hasn't had high populations. Whereas America has had high populations in Central uh, America, but only recently variable climate change. But it gets worse than that. Migrants, Okay, like the white throat goes from bush at one end to a bush at the other end, but it has stopping places along the way. It has links in the chain. 
And so this idea of habitat removal applies to each link in the chain. And only one link, as you know, has to fall out of the chain for the whole chain to fall apart. So back to white throats, and this is an anecdotal example, but I think this is probably true, and I wish we'd been monitoring things properly um, at the time. We were monitoring it in Europe, but we weren't in Africa. One year, 1967, we had 5 million breeding white throats in the UK. The following year, we had 2.5 million white throats. We lost half the UK breeding population, a massive crash and disappearance of white throats from lots of areas. And that was the point that the rains failed in the Sahel and we moved into a, one of these dry periods, quite a rapid shift. White throats are a little bit unusual in that they stage in the Sahel. Remember the tracking uh, of the common white throats that I showed you earlier. So they use the Sahel as a refueling site. And they do this on the way down and they also do it on the way up. And particularly they feed on these bushes. I've got a PhD student there, Jared Wilson, um, standing in front of the Salvador Persica bushes. Now this is April. So even though there hasn't been any rain for a while, this is a normal year, you've still got leaves and you've also got berries. And these have got lovely oily berries. The white throats arrive in April, feed up, cross the Sahara successfully. But you know what berry bushes do in a drought, you don't get berries. So the white throats appeared spring of 1968, beginning of the set, uh, start of the Sahara Desert to refuel, no berries, half of them didn't make it. The link in the chain fell apart. And what humans are doing, in this case it was uh, natural climate change, but what we're doing now is we're removing these links. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of different links because they all have individual journeys, but we're chipping away. We're removing its death by a thousand cuts. And if you look at population trends in terms of migration distance, and you assume that a migrant that goes a longer distance has more links in the chain, you find that those migrants that go further have more steeply declining populations. So this is the smoking gun. Um, in terms of this chain link hypothesis. So these similar levels of connectivity, i.e. the wide spreading out of the populations, may help to explain migrant declines generally. So have a look at this um, schematic. You've got three populations in Europe and one green might be increasing because it's good breeding habitat, red might be decreasing because they're being hunted or, or, or something, but they all occupy a similar area in Africa. And any change within that area, so a bit of habitat drops off here, drops off there, in Senegal, in Mali, wherever, is affecting all three populations negatively. So all three populations have a decrement, a decline shown uh, on them, just dragging it uh, down. If you try to track this down, it's very, very difficult. So I've tried to relate populations that are declining with where they're wintering in Africa to test the hypothesis that those populations of, that occur in areas where there is increasing human population are more likely to be declining at a faster rate than those where there are fewer people. Trouble is they spread out over such a wide area, it's very difficult to get specific areas. But anyway, this is my attempt at it we end up with another one of these quite weak relationships. That yes, there is a signal that we have this general drawdown of migrant populations where there is increasing human populations, removal of habitat. But what's really interesting is that I thought that species like the windchat, remember the windchat and the tomato plantation that loves intensive farmland, I thought that some species that really like intensive farmland would be unaffected. They would actually increase because surely increasing human population, intensification of um, farmland, changing habitat for farmland would make things better for these species. But no, they're declining as well. And then we start thinking about intensification of farmland, the pesticides, the herbicides, all the things that we've been doing in Europe 
are now being replicated in Africa. And we know what that does to our farmland birds, to our breeding birds. We're dragging down the carrying capacity of those areas. So the habitat is not only being removed, it's also being massively uh, degraded. So what's happening with migrant bird declines? Why are migrants declining and residents not? Well, it's actually not a mystery. The residents have already declined. The migrants haven't. They're now declining now. The migrants have this lifeline of Africa, but now that is being removed because the intensification processes that <laughs> reduced all our resident populations uh, over the last 150 years is now happening in Africa. So it's actually not really surprising. The only African species we monitor are the ones that come to Europe to breed and we monitor them very well. And we've got very nice things in place to monitor how they decline. All the other African species are declining as well. It's just no one's, no one's counting uh, them. So that sounds very, very depressing. But it's just a fact of life. More people on the planet, you have less, less wildlife. Migrants are not going to go extinct. They're fantastically resilient and able to deal uh, on evolutionarily and uh, shorter time, time scales with, with this variation. But there's less space on the planet for birds. There's less space in Africa now. So it's not surprising, really. So what do we do about it? Well, we need to think globally. We need to think about sustainable development. We need to think about these guys in Nigeria, these cucumber farmers who um, happily let me work, uh, work on their uh, farmland. Their birds, our birds, everybody's birds. It's a global problem that requires cooperation and solution and remember these migrants don't go to specific nature reserves we can't just like buy a load of nature reserves and say that's the end of the problem they're occupying the landscape where these people live the landscape that people cultivate their landscape so if we want the migrants to coexist we need more sustainable holistic type of solutions, i.e. we have to improve people's quality of life so that they can have sufficient resources to have nature conservation within the environment in which they live. It's all about land sharing rather than the land sparing approach. And to the last part of my talk, what can we do about it? Because I've talked about you know, airy fairy global solution, sustainable development. That's going to solve a lot of our problems. It's going to solve climate change. It's going to solve uh, quality of life. It's going to stop uh, human population uh, increase uh, and so on. We know we've got to do it. But what can we do in the short term? Well, when I first went to uh, Africa in uh, 1993, sorry, not the first time I went to Africa, the first time I started doing research there, um, I met Gus Azilia. Gus Azilia is a guy on the right there. He is the first person in Nigeria to get an ornithological PhD. Uh, he did it at an American university. He was looking at rough um, feeding on rice fields and the conflicts between the farmers, farmers uh, and, and the rough. Uh, went, on, went on to become a professor at one of the northern universities. The only ornithologist in Nigeria. So how do you generate a culture, a research culture, input into legislation, governance, an appreciation of the importance of conserving the natural environment and the places where people live so we can serve migrants if you have no capacity, if you have no experts, if you have no one to explain how it all works, if you have no one to infuse people to look at and appreciate what's in the environment uh, around them. So that's what I've been doing over the last 20 years, trying to do. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute, that's where I, where I do my research, but I also teach there. And each year we have a cohort of master's uh, students, by <laughs> coincidence, this cohort is all, all um, male. Uh, next year's was nearly all, all female. Um, so we give 
a year's intensive master's course in conservation biology, six months taught, six months uh, research, to give the basic training so that the students can then go on to get PhDs, uh, get on to PhD programs internationally. And we've got a very high hit rate, but about a quarter of our graduates end up doing PhDs abroad. But the best part of it is they're studying, they're ornithologists, they're passionate about the environment, they do their PhD abroad, gain the skills, they come back to Africa, they come back to Nigeria, they come back to West Africa, because who is really interested in a conservation biologist from Nigeria in the US? There are plenty of conservation biologists uh, about, they are much more valuable within Africa. So it's not like training medical doctors. Most um, African uh, trained medical doctors don't go back to Africa. You just take away the resources from the continent. You make the problem worse, you improve the quality of our lives. But within capacity building, within conservation, we've, got, we've had a return to actually do, um, sorry, my screen is frozen, there we are. And have a look at, after the talk or tomorrow, at aplori.org. Just type in Aplori, A-P-L-O-R-I, into Google and you'll get onto this. But look at the capacity building page and read some, some of the stories. All of the uh, people there I've taught um, and a quarter of them have completed PhDs, another quarter are in the stage of completing uh, PhDs. And if we look at their destinations, oh, there's a cohort where it's mostly, mostly women, um, apart from Omo in the middle. I'm not sure whether he was pleased about it or intimidated, but um, we've got a very high proportion of our graduates that have remained active in conservation and have spread throughout uh, Africa. The head of BirdLife Africa is one of our graduates, head of Flora and Flora uh, International's uh, Liberia program, one of our uh, graduates, head of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, so the equivalent of the RSPP uh, in Nigeria, one of our graduates. It's an, almost an absolute vacuum uh, that we're trying to fill, but we have to do something. And just to finish up, how much of a difference that we've made. Um, when you start with zero, if you do anything, you make a difference. So what you're looking at on the left hand side is the number of ornithological papers produced in Nigeria, so where Aplor is based, um, in three periods, three decades. And basically there's not a lot ha happening until Aplori gets founded in 2002 and then things start to kick off. And if you compare the ornithological research, now ornithological research is trivial, but let's consider that's an index of capacity to appreciate conservation problems and to influence people to do something about conservation uh, problems. Nigeria has overtaken the weakest performing country in Europe, which if you want to know is Greece, um, I don't have any particular reason, reason for it. Just one research institution training conservation biologists, masters, allowing them to get onto PhDs and then to get back into the fabric of the country, uh, to get into governance, to get into teaching, to get into N NGOs and has made this uh, measurable difference. So where are we with this? Migrants are absolutely brilliant, they're flexible, they will be with us forever. There won't be as many migrants while there are so many people, but if we have lots of people who understand the basic requirement of um, the migrants, and it's not rocket science, it's leaving habitat in the landscape in the same way you would in Europe. Keep the hedgerows, keep the trees, keep the watercourses uh, vegetated, have fields, 
but have the connecting landscape between retained areas, uh, small areas, and you'll have migrants. We'll have good populations in Africa and we'll have good populations uh, in Europe. So anyway, thank you very much um, for listening to me. It seems like a, a, bit of a, uh, a bit of a marathon. I'm all used to talking for 45 minutes, but anyway, I'm uh, here to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Will. That, that was absolutely fascinating. And um, a lot of my, it's, it's uh, changed a lot of my uh, preconceptions about wind chats and migrants. And so many, uh, so many things that um, I've learned tonight. Um, are there any questions in, in the hall or um, on the chat? Yeah, I've, uh, I've, my... going back to the geolocators, you obviously, uh, Will was obviously delighted when you when you found one that's got data. What kind of percentage of the locators actually get recovered? Um, so the, the, uh, I'll repeat the question. The, the, the question was what proportion of geolocators do you get back? And uh, the answer is if doing research on geo we, involving geolocators is roughly equivalent to going to the bank withdrawing your savings and setting fire to it um, <laughs> it's a very low low return rate um one of these geolocators costs um costs about 125 pounds but i have to put about 10 uh to get 10 on to get to get one back so you don't Half the birds die anyway, nothing to do with the geolocators, so that you've lost five, one's dropped off, one the battery's failed, and another two birds you can't catch. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm very impressed by the amount of effort you put into it. <laughs> well, I've got, I, I have got better, better at it with, <laughs> with wind chats, but very painfully. But, but compared to ringing recoveries, that, that's quite a good... Uh, return, isn't it? And that must be due to the the birds, um, the fidelity to the uh, wintering sites. Yeah, well, I think the the only difference between what what we're doing and say any and bird ringing is is that we absolutely have to get those birds back. So we really put put the effort in when when you're doing con constant effort, miss miss netting you know you're you're happy you're cat you're cat catching birds you're not thinking oh that sedge warbler which i caught last year is now avoiding my net so i'm now going to move my nets along to see if i can catch it i mean that invalidates the ces protocol um in in any way so it's just a different it's a different attitude i often have you know have a have a pint with a ringer and they say what are you talking about it's easy to catch birds and they're absolutely right it is easy to catch birds but if you have to catch that bird, then it's hard. Uh, can I have a question, please, Rob? Yes, carry on, Renton. Uh, thanks very much, Will. That was that was brilliant. I had a long list of questions, which you actually answered all brilliantly in the last ten minutes or so of the talk. It was wonderful. Uh, a question about the sustainability efforts that you, you're making that you said so need to be made in Africa. Are you finding it easy to get governments to buy in? Well, I, I spent a few days in Abuja once trying to talk to various government officials about deforestation. And frankly, it was not a very unrewarding experience. Yeah. Um, I, in, in a way, I'm a, I'm a coward in the sense that I'm avoiding what you were, you were trying to do there and, and actually confronting some, some, uh, some of the re reality uh, of it. I know that things will be easier in the future if there's a greater pool of people that understand and that there are experts and that they are embedded within government or they went to university and they had a lecturer that was explaining how it was. 
in a in a in a good situation. So it it is going to take uh, take a long a long time, and I have the utmost respect, um, you know, for proper conservationists that actually yeah go and go and try and persuade governments to do uh, to do stuff because that's the most heartbreaking thing. Out because even when when a politician you explained it to them and they actually get it but they still jump the other way because of expediency or because they want to vote that yeah sadly it happens here too <laughs> ab ab absolutely at, at least you know being being an academic i can wave my arms around and i can try uh, try and explain to as many people as possible and hope for the best but yeah it's a tough one uh, there's at least one person on the Zoom call I think would like to ask a question. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Ali. Uh, thank you very much, Will, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, um, I raised so many questions at almost every slide, but uh, so I'll just confine myself to uh, two um, questions, really. One is uh, perhaps a bit more trivial. It's, uh, in Eastern Europe, where I do a lot of birding, I quite often have falls in the spring. So when I look at all those birds covering the fields and the roadways, are they actually all coming from different parts of Africa, you know, like collared flycatchers and wheat ears, and just crossing over? Or, I mean, because when you see it, you think, oh, they've all probably come from the same place and are migrating as a group. And, and um, you know, is that actually happening? Is it's just, it's just a false impression. And the second uh, question I'd just like to ask is, um, what do you think are the implications of your research for this typical flyway approach to conserving African uh, passerines? So the answer to your first question is that these, when you, you're in the middle of a middle of a fall, no, they're all, they're definitely not going going to the same same place. Um, certainly, if they're staging staging on the way to northern northern Europe, it's just there's a whole load of birds migra migrating uh, and they get pushed pushed together by the way uh, by the wind rain whatever and brought brought down second question fly flyway approach now it, it's quite incredible that when i've looked in the literature about my migratory connectivity sooner or later you come across to a diagram which has got africa sorry, Europe at the top, Africa at the bottom, and then some arrows. And one goes down the middle, and one goes down one side, and one goes down the other side. And they talk about the West Flyway and the East Flyway and the Central Flyway. It's fiction. It's absolute fiction. I don't know, somebody in National Geographic in the 50s like drew it, and it somehow got in the literature. And I review papers where people talk about, we split our data into this flyway and that flyway, and I'm thinking, what flyway? Um, so, yeah, knots have a flyway. Western sandpipers have a, have a flyway. You've clearly got some species that do it, but the majority don't. Mm. And so you've, it, you want to connect up sites, to, but it's not a case of a linear thing. It is a network. And a site here, a site there, doesn't matter where they are, as long as you've got sites. So it is a, it is a flyway way of thinking, but it's not so deterministic. Thank you. Yeah, very, I, I must, I'm partly responsible for that. I mean, a long time ago, I was, <laughs> oh, director, no. of, <laughs> I was director of conservation at BirdLife, and we were issuing all these charts and flyways and trying to blame Malta and southern France for shooting you know, disproportionate numbers of particular populations, and that's clearly not the case. I don't uh, know that the, the Malta, Malta, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Thank God Malta's so small. Yes, uh, and um, no, it's really fascinating. Uh, you know, since proper marking came out, um, you know, uh, and geolocators and so on, in the last well decade, fifteen years, it's just amazing how all these myths about migration have been really blown up, and we have to take a more holistic view. And um, what you know. what we, what we need, Paul, and I've been waiting for this to be be invented. Um, is and unfortunately I've, I call it the death tag, which is a bad name for it. But essentially, it's something the size of a bird ring that you can give to ringers everywhere, and they put on just like a bird ring. And after any variable amount of time, it just sends one signal up to the satellite, which tells you where the bird is and whether the bird's alive or dead. 
And then we work absolutely everything out because I only get the live birds back. And the really interesting stuff is the ones that die. That's that would, you know, I'm in a way I'm kind of wasting my time in 50 years time. Someone will be doing the talk and saying, oh, look at this Cresswell bloke. He was he was like use, using a steam engine when really he needed to needed a laser. And uh, look at all the misconceptions he had because yeah. decent piece of kit, that piece of kit. And it's it's sorted in one season. We need millions of birds tagged with just one piece of information, not 10 birds tagged and a million pieces of information. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I'll get, I, I could talk for ages, but I'll give away to the, to the next yeah. question. Thank you very much. We've got time for just one more quick question. If there is one. Uh, okay. Is, uh... Well, I, I, I think that Will has, um, in his very clear talk, he's answered all our questions. Um, he's covered a lot of science tonight, and it's been absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much, Will. Okay, it, it did become a bit of a dismal story to, um, in the middle, <laughs> but you've ended a positive note, and it's, we, we wish you a lot of success with the, the training. That you're doing for the uh, young ornithologists in Africa and we look forward to to the changes that they bring about in the future so thank you thank you <laughs>